Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Welcome to the GSMC College Football Podcast on the GSMC Podcast Network. I am their host. Usually, you know who it is. It is your right-hand man. It's Ethan here to talk to you about some college football going on in the United States of America because they don't play college football really much elsewhere. Not, uh, I guess, not semi-professionally at least. More rec sports stuff. I heard there's some UK leagues that play. Uh, American football, so to speak. Interesting stuff. Regardless, this is about college football, and we have some college football topics to sort through today, some of which are fun, some of which are not too fun, some of which are here to inform. So we have some more coronavirus updates, some more some more looking ahead of this whole timetable of just how many schools are going to be playing, because we don't know really how many schools are going to play in the first place. And, of course, we must talk about what's been going on in this country as far as uh, racial dynamics, as far as governmental systems, police brutality. Because we have to talk about it primarily because everyone is talking about it, one, which means even your sports figures, even your coaches, your players, everyone's speaking about it. So I have to you know, give my take on what everybody else is saying and why some things are not where they need to be. But first, we are going to be talking about our good old friend, Mr. Harbaugh, Mr. Michigan, because like most people try to predict when somebody could come somewhere, they also predict when it's time to go. Uh, Jim Harbaugh has been underneath a, a proverbial hot seat, for at least two years now, I think. I think last year, definitely, his hot seat definitely took off to another level, and people were not ready to, were not only ready to give him the boot, but also ready for change. I think Michigan is ready for change. They've had him for five years, and I don't think necessarily it has to do with the quality level of his coaching, per se, Granted, he has not really won a meaningful game in a very long time, but I don't think that is as big of a detriment to his coaching ability. Now, his resume is not looking very good as a coach right now as far as wins, losses, and really, really impactful wins are not there. So that's fair criticisms. But, of course, everybody knows at this point, it, it looks really, really bleak to see somebody that can build a program to take down Ohio State in the in the next two to three years in that in that conference. You know, the Big Ten. Uh, there's a lot of top heavy top heavy talent, but for the overall, we all know the big dogs uh, and the the biggest dog of them all is Ohio State, and they have made that known several times over the last several years, in the last four or five, really. And that's where how long Jim Harbaugh has been there. So Jim has been underneath some, some heavy scrutiny about not being able to really, really pull a W out of here. So a lot of people have been projecting, if this is his last season, who is available to to go get in the coaching, in the coaching departments for a head coach? And if there isn't anyone that really fits your fancy, are you just going to stick with Jim Harbaugh at the end? 
or are you still going to try and move on no matter what? And this is his last, his last dance, so to speak. Well, this nice article I found talks about some coaches who potentially might be a candidate in the, in the future if this does indeed become an actual thing. So the first on this list is Matt Campbell from Iowa State. And he has extensive Midwest ties and understands winning culture for his days at Division Three Powerhouse Mount Union and traditional MAC contender Toledo. Became a head coach just at 32 years old and won four Conference Coach of the Year awards in his decade-long tenure. He led Iowa State to its most successful conference seasons over ever in the Big 12 and as well as the most consecutive winning conference records in the Big 12. Uh, his first Cyclones coach since Earl Bruce to have multiple wins against top 10 teams in consecutive eight win seasons. He embraces being the face of the program and is transparent with the traditional media as well as very active on social media. He empathizes playing or he emphasizes playing traditional hard nosed football with innovation and is a tireless recruiter. His defensive coordinator, John Heacock, is perhaps the best in the Big 12 and was a grad and was a grad assistant at Michigan for Bo uh Schimblecker or <laughs> Skin Bleacher. Finally two in his final two seasons way back in the 80s. So, he has struggled against his biggest rival Iowa. So, that's Matt Campbell. He sounds like a pretty decent candidate so far. So good. So, PJ Fleck the coach of Minnesota, I'm sure you all are aware of Minnesota's rise to kind of relevancy within the college football ranks. Uh, he is a Jim Trestle prodigy, and Fleck began his coaching career as a grad assistant at Ohio State after his playing days and worked his way up to full-time assistant on the 2006 squad and spent most of the season ranked number one after stints with Joe Novak at his alma mater in northern Illinois and Greg Schiano at Rutgers and Tampa Bay in the NFL. Uh, P.J. Fleck became the first FBS head coach born in the 1980s when Western Michigan hired him in 2013. In his first year, the Broncos were an abysmal 1-11, but after recruiting the top class in the MAC three consecutive years, he turned the program all the way around to a 13-0 regular season in 2016. Western Michigan was also the group of five representatives in the New York or I'm sorry, in the new year six. He got off to a slow start at Minnesota as well, but in his third year, the Gophers had their most wins since 1904 in the highest final ranking since 1962. Like his mentor, Trestle, he is a prominent of power, or the proponent of power spread. He's omnipresent in the community and media, and as well as a dynamic recruiter. His boundaries, his, his boundless energy and Sloganeering are loved by players once they buy in and sneered by at the media. <laughs> but that sounds like, I don't know, these guys all sound like they are very, very casual coaches as far as very, very approachable guys. So approachability is something that I'm sure Michigan would love to have. Not to say that Jim Harbaugh is not approachable, but, you know, Jim can be stuck in his ways about certain things. Next on this list is Chris Peterson, and he was considered one of the top 10 overall coaches in the sport before his abrupt resignation at Washington following the 2019 season. He stepped down, citing stress and needed to recharge his battery. Without question, he's the most qualified potential candidate, but you have to make sure he's fully committed to returning to coaching college football. Plus, other than one season as a position coach at Pittsburgh, he spent his entire career out west. He won three National Coach of the Year awards and seven conference titles in his 14 seasons as a head coach, led Washington to a college football playoff in 2016, and then consecutive New Year's Six Bowls the following two seasons. Was basically a legend at Boise State before that. He never had a losing season or a hint of scandal as a head coach, uh, and combines an old-school demeanor with a new-school schematics and X and O's, and he had a almost an 80% win percentage, 
and he's a lock for a college football hall of fame and he's still a year younger than Jim Harbaugh. So all that being said, he sounds like he's a pretty good guy. Now we're going to go ahead and finish this off with one more is Scott Sanderfield out of Louisville. So this would be an ironic hire because Sanderfield is a former Appalachian state player and assistant and head coach. And yes, he was the quarterback's coach of the 2007 team that pulled off the infamous upset at the big house. He only has has only been a head coach in the FBS level for six years, but he's won conference titles in half of those two conference coach of the year awards and never had a losing record. After a dominant tenure at his alma mater, Scatterfield took over at the Louisville program that became into 2019 on a nine game losing streak. He ended up leading the Cardinals to an eight game win streak or eight win season, which included the program's first road win against a ranked opponent in almost a decade and is known for his wide open offenses, although only finishing with the 42nd ranked recruiting class after such a stressful first season is a red flag. Still, without a doubt, he's considered one of the game's rising coaching stars. So, those are some people that potentially could replace Jim Harbaugh if it all came to be. But it's all speculation. You never know. Anyway, that's the first segment. We're going to take a break and we're going to be talking about some coronavirus potential scares coming up in the NCAA. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Okay, so we're back with GSMC. And was it it not just only a few wee weeks ago where we were worried about if college football was going to return this fall and if we were going to be able to move forward and get something done, something on paper, something concrete? Well, we are a lot closer to getting things concrete, but we still don't know if college football is going to be 100% back in the way we like to think it would be. So... College officials believe a possibility still exists that some schools will not play college football this season in the fall. And, of course, NCAA President Mark Ermet told congressional leaders this week creating a scheduling cha- creating scheduling challenges that officials are currently examining. So there was a conference call on Wednesday with House Republicans, Ermet, and several professional sports executives updating lawmakers on each of their restarting plans in an encouraging call, apparently from Representative Steve uh, Scalzi as the Republican uh, representative of Louisiana. So the minority, uh, uh, he's the minority with Scalzi, who's taking on the role of sports within the White House's task force to reopen the economy, spoke to Sports Illustrated Thursday about the call, and it included Roger Goodell, uh, NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman, PGA Commissioner Jay Monahan, NASCAR President Steve Phelps, and of course, Mr. Ermet himself. The representative emerged from the call with confidence that the NFL and college football will play this fall with fans in the stands. So that's new. Fans in the stands sound much more confident, much more thing that might happen though they may be wearing masks and receiving temperature checks while entering stadiums. College football, meanwhile, could be missing some of the 130 teams that make up the football bowl subdivision. Uh, That's what uh, Emert told leaders. So there are some schools that may not play football this season, and that's their choice. They'll then have to modify the schedule to work around that. 
They're working through that right now. But most want to start back again, and most schools are working towards bringing students back in the fall. And that's a big driver, too. You want to work with the schools so sports aren't ahead of academics, so you can do both at the same time. So this is immense, or immense speaking. Of course, last month, conference commissioners expressed doubt that all 130 FBS programs would start the season on time. But since then, mostly positive news has followed. Slow opening West Coast states, namely California, were thought at one point to be in jeopardy of playing a season. But that's since changed. And meanwhile, dozens of schools have already started welcoming athletes to campus for voluntary workouts. And the NCAA leaders have even agreed on a plan for a on-time kickoff on Labor Day weekend. Optimally, a football team should hold six weeks of training before kicking off, and at minimum, a team needs four weeks. Uh, and this is the West uh, West Virginia Athletic Director and Chair of Division One Football Oversight Committee, a powerful rulemaking body. So this is Shane uh, Leon's speaking about this, which makes sense because you need people to go out there and get warmed up, loosened up, figure some things out, you know, install game plans, all that in a bag of chips. They need to do that. June workouts are the first in what officials are considering a four-step process to starting the season. One Step one is voluntary workouts in June. Step two is workouts in early to mid-July with coach interactions. Step three is two weeks of NFL-style OTAs in late July. And four is mandatory four-week camp in August. Under the plan, if a team does not complete four weeks of practice, they cannot start the season because states are in various reopening stages. Some schools could be behind others. For example, teams are beginning voluntary workouts at different times, some starting as early as this past Monday and others not beginning until July. Conceivably, virus outbreaks on a team could interrupt training and potentially delay it from starting the season on time. Already, several schools have announced that athletes and staff members have tested positive for coronavirus upon arriving on campus. Almost all of them were asymptomatic, which doctors say is the virus's deadliest threat, an invisible opponent. So if somebody is not allowed to practice until August 15th and their first game is September 5th, or December 5th, they may miss the first two weeks because of their state not might not allow them to return in time. So there is a feeling that we can't wait for everybody. And that would, of course, create logistical scheduling nightmares and possibilities that the NCAA leaders are examining. Of course, that's what emerged to lawmakers. They're definitely looking at the challenges that would be poised that would be posed if some schools won't play to participate. They're aware that going to be a case with a few schools and hopefully is limited. Each school makes their own decision and that the NCAA is going to work with that to put together a season that works for the safety of the players, the schools, and hopefully as well as the fans. So stadiums may not necessarily be in full this fall, but Scousy expects some amount of fans. This includes Scousy himself, an avid fan of New Orleans Saints and LSU Tigers. He wants to be there in the Superdome when Drew Brees beats Tom Brady in September, and he wants to be in Tiger Stadium where Coach O brings the team back out to defend their national title. And he's sure that there will be people wearing masks. Maybe not all people want to come back, but people he talks to want to be in the stadium They'll be careful. If you see somebody coughing, they're going to probably go the other way and they'll probably have temperature checks. And he thinks that it's going to be some part of testing protocol for a lot of sports leagues. And like many sports officiados, Scalzi is tired of watching what he called 25-year-old games. <laughs> so I guess all the throwback games are not everybody's cup of tea. And it's understandable because especially if you're a big sports fan, you've probably seen a lot of them. And he believes sports will help restore the mental health of the country. He compares the post-corona restarting of sports to the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which rocked his native land a year after the hurricane decimated much of South Louisiana and Mississippi coast. The Saints reopened the Superdome, which just months earlier it was used as a giant triage facility. 
And with a game against the Atlanta Falcons that produced one of the most electric environments for a sporting event in Louisiana history, sports really are the most unifying parts of our society. Scalzi says they bring people together. If you can bring big sports events back, it shows others that they can come back. And, of course, this worked for for them in New Orleans. After Hurricane Katrina, the Saints became a rallying point. The Dome was a symbol of the worst elements of Katrina and then became one of the most unifying symbols when the game against the Falcons happened. It showed the city came back and brought people together. People want to see their teams again and want to have things to rally around. We can't be afraid of disease. We're Americans, so to say what he says. We don't cower from challenges. We face them head on. We're smart and we'll learn how to safely get back. So lots of quotables there from different lawmakers and, of course, from the NCAA commissioner and or I'm sorry. A lot of different things. So it really, really, really sounds like college football is going to come back no matter what. And is really, really being carried by a lot of these southern politicians and these guys from the south and of course you know we see guys from bigger conferences so the sec is very vocal about this the big 12 is very vocal about the pac 12 i'm sorry is very vocal about this the big 10 is very vocal about this they all want to make their money they all want to get their sports back but the fact that they really want to include fans is something that honestly i didn't think would be so Ad, they would be so adamant about, but I guess it's because of the revenue from stadium sales and food and vendorship and all that. So I should have thought about that a little bit more, but I guess the ideology is they're going to have to do something for the time to make up for it. So they probably need more fans than none, than none in order to help out for when things get really rough, potentially in the winter start in the early winter because once we get to december things may change and we won't know until that comes but people are predicting that the second wave will be around that time anyway so with that being said we're going to take another break and we'll continue on some of these similar topics on the gsmc tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts now listen close and hear this out There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. As you know, this is GSMC, and we're back. So, (laughs) like I was saying, as you know, a lot of different universities, a lot of different programs across the country, especially in the Southeastern Conference specifically, are having some players having the ability to return to the campus in order to do uh, voluntary workouts with their teams. And this is usually what their strength coaches and it's like eight hours per week that they can meet up with said strength coaches and uh, work out. So build muscle flex, if you know what I'm saying. And Alabama, of course, they are going to be on the forefront of all this. But unfortunately, uh, the reality of the situation is like a lot of people would think. There have been some positive tests for COVID-19. Now, the University of Alabama football players have been coming back to campus this week. And upon arrival, all the athletes were tested for the novel coronavirus. And 
According to sources, at least five players have tested positive for COVID-19, and the news was first reported by Bama Insider. Bama Central had reached out to the university official, but the confirmation or comment on the matter has not been given yet. And, of course, there was an update from this that the Office of Strategic Communications at Alabama released a statement that the health and safety of the student-athletes is top priority and resources and protocols are in place to ensure they receive the best medical care when returning to campus due to privacy laws. They cannot share information specific to the health of their student-athletes. And Tuscaloosa County has reported 836 confirmed cases of the virus with 14 deaths, according to the state's Department of Public Health. Almost 400 of the new cases have come in the last 14 days. So, last month... The Southeastern Conference approved in-person voluntary workouts to begin June 8th for all respective schools. So Alabama Athletic Director Greg Byron, or yeah, Greg Byron, released this statement concerning how the Crimson Tide would handle in-person activities. So the health and safety of everyone, including our student athletes, coaches, staff, and fans, have been and will continue to be at the forefront as we prepare to return. Byron also said, we appreciate the leadership and guidance of the Southeastern Conference and its return to activity and medical guidance task force throughout the situation to best equip our campuses with educational materials and recommendations on best practices. He also states that resumption of voluntary in-person activity is an important step in moving us forward this fall athletic season which we all are fully preparing for with a phased approach beginning june 8th so in addition to our public health officials we are fortunate to have an elite sports medicine staff here in alabama from our athletic trainers to our team doctors that we'll be able to continue to take direction from as we make decisions from a safe return so they look forward to welcoming back our student athletes, coaches, and staff on the campus. So, some of the players have been using million dollar brand or million dollar bands practice field uh, to work out since they have not been able to return to Tuscaloosa, as seen in videos below. And the workouts were player led and not structured by any coaches. So, there's been, of course, a lot of players that's come together and tried to work out with one another because you got to be able to stay in shape. And at a certain point, you need other players and other people to really work on your skills. So, of course, you see uh, Alabama wide receivers and such. So you'll see, like, Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddle, Slade Bolden, John Mechie, Javon Baker, Waddle again, Smith again versus Maurice Barks and Xavier Williams is just doing some cornerback v. wide receiver work see all this sort of stuff so this isn't something that is going to be a one-off incident i'm sure other schools will have similar issues because although these people have tested for coronavirus my understanding is they've all been asymptomatic so that's the scary part if they're carrying the virus and have shown no symptoms that means anybody could be potentially in danger of having a an outbreak at some point. And I'm sure team officials, team doctors are keeping a very, very vigilant eye on all of this. And they are aware of the, how this could go. Now, of course, they came to campus with the virus. So this isn't a, a way of, see, all these guys came back and they can't handle it or, or the you know, too much, too many people in one place is too much going on. And the fact of the matter is with all the reopenings, you don't know where or when this occurred. You don't know how they got it. We'll never know really how they got it at the time. So at this point, we can only assume that everybody eventually is going to carry this virus at some point. And it is going to be worse than it gets better as far as the the contagion to it. Now, because a vaccine has not yet been produced. So people are going to catch the virus 
And a lot of them will show no symptoms, but some will. And of course, you'll have to do your social distancing to keep yourself at, like, you know, away from harm's way. And also to be able to function later on. Because if somebody gets sick on the team, of course, that'd be very unfortunate and they'll have to find a replacement. But for the most part, these guys are youthful and they're probably in the best physical shape of their of their natural born lives at this point. So not to say that this virus is beatable because of physical fitness, but you know, unless they have real pre existing health concerns, they should be able to fight off the disease if symptoms show, if they show at all. So that's where a lot of these coaches, a lot of these officials are thinking that a lot of these guys are going to show up with the virus. They are going to have to be tested around the clock to make sure things are not getting out of hand. But it is going to be interesting, like we recently spoke about, is delays. So we have no idea just how much this will delay people's progress in making a really, really solid return back to the sport. What I mean by that is, of course, is if they have to put people on ice for 14 days before they can come back and practice with their teammates due to coronavirus, then it is going to throw off a lot of camaraderie, going to throw off a lot of chemistry balances sometimes. And we don't know how that will affect certain programs at all, because if a bunch of people test positive for coronavirus after the first initial test, they're going to have to sit everybody down. And it's going to be a situation where are you going to have to wait till everybody's cleared? And there's a lot of people on a football field. There's a lot of people in coaching staff. There's a lot of people in medical staff that have to make sure that they are being 100% focused on staying safe all the time. And it's going to be tough because you're more used to not having to worry about this sort of stuff than you are used to. So you're going to slip up. You're going to mess up. You're going to high-five your man. You're going to chest bump. You're going to get excited. You're playing football. It's a contact sport. You're going to be around people. You're going to be hidden, folks. You're going to be real close. You're going to be shoulder pad to shoulder pad, helmet to helmet. Hopefully not, but you know what I mean. Face mask to face mask sometimes. There's collisions. You're going to be up close and personal with a lot of guys. So... It can only, this is what I mean by it, it can only really get worse at this point. And I think they've made this a calculated risk to some degree that this is just what is going to have to occur for college football or football in general, really, to come back. So with that being said, you have to look at it from outside the perspective of being a normal person, right? Normal people can social distance their tails off, but football players can't. It's in the nature of the game to be up close and personal. So with that said, we're going to take our next break and coming out, we are going to move on into some other topics of conversation. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Okay, welcome back to GSMC. And... Remember a few months ago when coronavirus first started and college coaches just didn't seem to say the right stuff and it didn't look to see that people really did their research on anything and I mean, no one really knew what the right answers of what was right, but we definitely knew 
what was wrong to say at the time and what was considered insensitive to the times that be. Well, we're back at it again, but with a much more, more hurtful topic, so to speak, as a lot of college coaches have been suspended or put on leave due to what they've said currently in the past or just flat out insensitive remarks about Black Lives Matter, about what's been going on in this country as far as racial tension and everything involved in that. So first up to bat is Utah. Utah suspends defensive coordinator Morgan Scaly for texting racist or racial slur in 2013. So Utah suspended their coordinator for a text from 2013. The athletic director, Mark Harland, said in a statement Friday that he's made aware of the social media post that referenced the text message. Utah will have an outside firm review the matter for more details and to determine whether or not it was an isolated incident. Morgan will be suspended until the review is complete. Harlan says that the use of any form of racist language is not only anti-ethical to our policies and our values, but is also a front to all of us, especially our African-American community members. So Morgan acknowledged that the use of the slur or acknowledged the use of the slur and apologized in a statement released by the school in 2013. He made a terrible mistake, he says, and he used a racial slur in the text message. This language is offensive and hurtful and not only the black or the African-American community, but to all. Immediately after kneeling or sending it, he apologized to the recipient and his family. And he was heartbroken over the potential breach of trust with his fellow coaches and with the young men in his program, both past and present. So... On Friday night, former Utah cornerback Ryan Lacey tweeted that Scaly directed a racial slur at him in 2008. So he states, I too was called a racial slur, the N-word, by this man in 2008, confronted him my senior year in 2013, held on to it five years, and got a half-butt apology, more on terms of an excuse. And he's he is a great coach, but needs to be a better man. Truth hurts. God bless. <laughs> which is uh, a really interesting way of putting some things. But, yeah, there it doesn't sound too good, and I'll be completely honest. If you were saying, if you sent a text message that you could have went, reviewed, and changed up before you hit send to somebody, and you still sent it, there's probably more more things that they could find. And I would be more... It'd be more believable that this investigation is probably to find more things before the internet does to flag it all down and delete before it is to go let go of their defensive coordinator and move on. But the next story. So remember how we were just talking about Iowa? Well, Iowa football strength and conditioning coach Chris Doyle has been placed on administrative leave. Head coach Chris Ferentes announced on Saturday night in wake of allegations by former players about racial issues within the program. The players said in Twitter posts that there were racial disparities within the program and several mentioned comments and actions Doyle had made towards them during their time with the Hawkeyes. Many of the discussions have been centered around our strength and conditioning program and coach Chris Doyle. So Ferentes said the statement he has spoken with him about the allegations posted on social media. They are troubling and have created a lasting impact on those players. Therefore, Coach Doyle has been placed on administrative leave immediately while there is an independent review. They agree that all parties have had their voices heard and their decision about how to move forward will be made. So the statement uh, said an independent review of the allegations will be conducted. Assistant football strength and conditioning coach, Coach Raymond Braithwaite, what a name right there, Raymond Braithwaite, will lead the strength and conditioning program in Doyle's absence. Iowa begins voluntary workouts on Monday. And Ferentes called this a defining moment in Iowa football program. So this was Ferentes' statement. Over the past 24 hours, 
He has seen some difficult and heartbreaking posts on social media. He appreciates the former players' candor and has been reaching out to many of them individually to hear to hear more about their experiences in his program. And he is planning on talking to all of them in the coming days, and this process will take some time. But changes begin by listening first. So, of course, many of the discussions have been centered around the strength and conditioning coach. And, of course, you know he's spoken with them. There has been a call for a cultural strength, a shift in their program, and therefore he's creating an ad, adversary meeting. Wow. An ad, advisory committee chaired by former player and made up of current and former players as well as department staff. So this will be a diverse group that will be able to share without judgment so we can all examine where we are today and how we can get better uh how to get a better environment in the program tomorrow. So football is a game of discipline and sacrifice in our program. There are high standards and accountability. We have a good team of players, coaches, and staff members, but it's clear we can do more to create a welcoming and respectful environment where every player can grow, develop, and become the best version of himself. And as he told them earlier this week, uh, he is a white football coach. Teaching is what he does best but it also is important to know when to be the student as in when to learn so of course several days ago players asked permission to post on social media so they could participate in the national discussion about injustices racism and inequality and as a team they agreed last thursday to lift the long-standing ban on players on social media so that you will be seeing them enter in a new broader conversation so these are painful times and as a leader you can learn a lot by listening but then you must take action so finally he told the team that change begins with us but truthfully it begins with himself so of course uh, the athletic director gary barta also released a statement that he was concerned about the recent comments being voiced by several former hawkeye football players on social media and it's important that we reach out and listen to the current and former student athletes we must be willing to improve and change so this is going on across all different parts of the country a lot of student athletes have been speaking out against certain coaches certain coaching staffs uh because of certain methods that have been used against them and it has been a long lasting problem within sports not just college but within sports in general of not being held accountable for what they say and you know we're not in the 1980s 1970s anymore where you have to be a complete horrible human being to get the best out of your players and to be honest, a lot of players these days are not going to deal with that. And at the at the end of it all, you do have to realize that this is a momentous change that's happened in the past two to three weeks of how people in the African-American community and black communities across the nation are responding and speaking up and stepping out of their comfort zones to speak about racial injustices and injustices in their own environments, in their own workplace, in their own practice, in their own habitats, in their own ecosystems, environments. Everybody is speaking up at one point or another about what's going on because this is what all we have to talk about. This is what all we see. Players are going to protest from professionals to student-athletes and coronavirus be damned at some point, but people are going out to voice their disapproval with what's been going on in this country for far too long. And of course, that also includes the injustices that have been in the racism that follows along in the coaching ranks. But we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back. 
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G- smcpodcast.com for more info. I mean have no place I mean as in it shouldn't be a thing racism shouldn't be a thing anywhere but it is it has been for as long as racism has existed and it's been in every aspect every piece of literature every television show every realm of consciousness racism has existed and it has been placed in every nook and cranny of entertainment to togethership to work, all different types of aspects, racism exists. You don't even know it. It's hard to know it if you are not, of course, the one being oppressed against. So I bring this up to talk about racism in college football and just my whole ideology on it. So I never played college football, so I don't know what it is to be a college football player. I did play high school football, and, you know, some things do still carry over, like team camaraderie, being with people, talking to coaches. Similar things do carry over. So from my personal experience and from experience of what other people have told me, people will say things that you just can't believe that they they will say in a locker room. Locker room talk, so to speak, I know that's been a coined term by certain individuals that basically whatever said in the locker room stays in the locker room. And that typically was a sentiment a lot of people still live by to this day. It's still probably lived by most teams, most corporations. Like people say things that do not leave rooms because they feel like that is supposed to be a place to where they can say whatever they want and it should be a safe space, quote unquote, and you can say what you want to. And especially when it comes to authority figures like coaches, like the coaching staff members, things like that, people will will get a big chest and say whatever they want. And that is not a, not something that should be, normalized even though it has become that and people forget that just because you think you can get away with saying it doesn't really mean that you can get away with saying it and I think a lot of people are starting to realize the power in their voice and speaking up against certain tactics used against them during football practice during games during meetings with coaches anything that revolves around certain coaches using language, using coded speech, being outright, just blatantly racist. People are speaking up against it. And we're seeing which coaches are understanding just how deep it goes because it doesn't always have to be, you know, white and black, is for lack of a better term. It doesn't always have to be night and day. Like what we'd see in... Uh, how to be racist or how not to be racist. Sometimes there's a lot of gray area stuff that falls underneath the same category and which has been holding society back for so long. And we're seeing a lot of coaches that live in this gray area that they really have no idea the daily struggles of the players they coach and the daily, the daily struggles of these these young men who they claim to 
want to always teach how to be men and want to, you know, it's more about giving these young men a chance to to grow up and learn and to take something away from all this besides just the game of football, right? Well, of course, that doesn't also that doesn't always translate well, especially when it comes from a place of not knowing where these players you recruit, where these players come from. So, for example, right, we all know exactly the situation at FSU where we saw a seminal star, Marvin Wilson, decide to refute a statement from their head coach, Mike Norville, and threaten a player strike. And in the middle of the night, it rather looked like events were beginning to be to that end. But, of course, something happened called leadership. So players and coaches met and positive tweets about unity and moving forward ensued. Wilson issued a video statement that showed incredible perspective, keeping the playing field side or keeping the playing field sidelined right where it belongs in times like this. So most recently, Norville tweeted a straightforward apology as he didn't make any excuses. He didn't blame the press or claim that he had been taken out of context and he didn't generalize by offering, offering some sort of, uh, blanket media cupola. So this was his statement. He says, I'm proud of Martin or Marvin for utilizing his platform to express his ex- reaction to my comments in an earlier interview. Last Saturday evening, I sent a text to a player individually to represent an opportunity for open communication with me. Many members of our team chose to respond and have more in depth conversations about issues and feelings. Marvin is right. It was a mistake to use the word every, particularly at this time. Words are important, and I'm sorry. Once again, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I was given to speak to our team more in depth as a result of Marvin being willing to express his feelings, and we will continue to communicate and work together to be a part of the solution to make our world a better place for all. So just one one thing, you know, tensions are high. But words and choices, uses of words can mean a whole lot. And we can't also forget just how much Davo Sweeney has really been under fire recently. And for right reasons. He has not really hit the mark. He missed it on Corona. He's missing it now. So he spoke on Monday and it really wasn't worth the wait. And that shouldn't surprise anyone. So. Many of his college football and basketball coaching brethren released statements over the course of what was a terrible weekend in America, which followed a terrible week, which continued a terrible cycle of police brutality against black people. And the kettle seemed to be angry, (laughs) anger boiled over, not just in Minneapolis, but over the scene of killing George Floyd, but everywhere from sea to shining sea to the United States was a rolling succession of protests and violent flashpoints and the force of these events jarred the eternal cautious collegiate coaching community out of a stasis mode and into statement mode some of them were eloquent and forceful some were trite some words seemed to come less from the heart and more from a recruiter's cynical sense which was the way of the wind blowing in the black community so but one prominent football coaching voice wasn't heard until monday and, of course, the voice of Davos Sweeney, the guy with the $93 million contract, winner of two national titles, and a man who has taken the Clemson Tigers to four of the last five college football playoff championship games. There was widespread wondering what was taking so long. And sometimes it's better to listen to speak, he said, when it was time to speak Monday. It's not about trying to speak first or something like that. And he spent this last week listening. To his credit, Sweeney didn't opt for the safety of a canned statement that was carefully shined up by the by the Clemson PR team. He spoke live Monday afternoon on a Zoom call, and his comments weren't an extension of many other comments, of course. So, to put it this way, the two most famous outspoken Christians at Clemson both had things to say about the death of Floyd and subsequent violence, and the 21-year-old quarterback was more willing to speak plainly than the 50-year-old coach. We're going to take a quick break here, and then we're going to continue on real soon. But to 
go ahead and speak on Trevor Lawrence. There was, there has to be a shift in the way of thinking. Rational must outweigh irrational. Justice must outweigh injustice. Love must outweigh hate. If you put yourself in someone else's shoes and you don't like how it feels, that's when you know things need to change. He says he's siding with his brothers that deal and consistently deal with things I will never experience. The injustice is clear, and so is the hate. It can no longer be explained away. And if you're still explaining it, check your heart and ask why. So that was Trevor Lawrence's. So we're going to go take a break here, and we're going to continue on with this conversation. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Okay, so continuing from where we left off, we were talking about uh, racism in college football, so to speak. And maybe we should just title this racism in just the world in general, but this is a college football podcast, and unfortunately, college football is not uh, exempt from racism, especially when majority of the player base are made of young black men. So... Of course, Trevor Lawrence gave a pretty quality speech, or should I say statement, more so than speech. He gave a nice statement about how he felt, and it sounded like it came from him, and it made a lot of sense, and it sounded like, you know, something that a, you know, a 22-year-old quarterback could craft up. Dabo Sweeney, on the other hand, on Monday... He said, first and foremost, I know that we're all hurting from Floyd, from the Floyd family and our country. I can speak for my entire staff and our team that in regard for sure. We have all witnessed just disgusting acts of evil that really the only word that I can appropriately use. What I know as I approach everything from a perspective of faith is that where there are people, there are going to be hate And there's going to be racism and greed and jealousy and crime and so on because we live in a (laughs) sinful fallen world. We've had so much bad news. Generalizing the death of a black man at the knee of a white police officer as a byproduct of our sinful world didn't exactly hit the mark. You can believe that the devil made Derek Chauvin do what he did, but... A specific acknowledgement that this was an act of police brutality perpetuated upon the black man in handcuffs would have helped convince the world that Davo gets it. And there have been previous reasons to doubt, of course. You know, Davo Sweeney has been known to comment at length on social issues. This is something that often comes with making millions of dollars and winning 80% of your games. And being, and you become an expert on everything that tends to be reinforced by people in your own orbit who consider winning football games only slightly less important than finding a COVID-19 vaccine. So when Dabo was asked in September 2016 about Colin Kaepernick and other NFL players kneeling in protest for police brutality during the national anthem, he delivered, uh, kinda a 98 world word, eight minute response. So, Dabo wasn't a fan of what Kaepernick did. He said, I don't think it'll be good and it'll be a distraction to your team. Of course, not a surprise given the, his stance on the evils, you know, of playing, of paying college players. He was unwilling to acknowledge the racial divide in the country. And it was so easy that we have a race problem, but we have a sin problem. Nor was he willing to concede or to see any ground on those unhappy with the state of America, some of these people need to be moved to another country, so to speak. That's what Dabo said. So Sweeney was asked about the love it or leave it comment Monday, and that was probably a harsh statement for sure. And like many people in their 50s, Sweeney probably dearly wanted to believe that America left racism behind decades ago. And of course, that is not the case. And it was never true, of course. 
and events keep reminding us that the children from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s haven't finished the job of fully advancing the cause of equality. Pro- progress, maybe. Uh, but the job isn't done yet and hasn't been done. So it's just been a, a huge miss on on his part. And quoting things like Martin Luther King uh, about creating tangible change. It's not, I mean, he's not the only one. Like, a lot of these coaches missed the mark. A lot of these players have missed the mark. Of course, we all saw what transpired with Drew Brees. And it was a really, really, really shocking thing. I think Drew Brees probably caught the worst 48-hour news cycle for an athlete on topics of of social justice than I've ever seen in my life. He, and, you know, his statements were insensitive. And they did not sound like he's listened to anything that his teammates have told him for years now. Because, of course, we're not going to make this a Drew Brees podcast, but Drew Brees kneeled in 2017 with his teammates for racial injustice. He did that. <laughs> like, he he did that. You can't say you didn't do that. And he knows he did that. And his ideology about the flag and kneeling, protesting, was so off base. And it was so shocking because we just never expected somebody who is the quarterback for a city that is very, very much has a very, very high African-American, high black population, the history, how long he's been there, the things that he should know. It just seemed to go right out the wayside. And just the the language of the, of what he said on that, on that call was just really, 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 really shocking for a lot of people, including his teammates, which really, really resonated with them was the fact that, it didn't seem like he was listening and that it was something that hurt them because they know that Drew Brees is supposedly a good man. I don't know if Drew Brees is a good man. I never met him. But they know from previous experiences being around him and all of that to the point where they felt like this was more of a, wow, I didn't know you could do something like this. I didn't know this is how you felt. And I don't know where this is coming from. So, of course, you know, apologies were thrown out there. But that was, uh, of course, way after the the onslaught of uh, critiques from different avenues. Like, when I tell you this, this crossed over the sports boundaries, like this went from NFL to basketball to even college sports to just people who had a platform who – either no Drew Brees or no up Drew Brees and it just kind of went all over the place but he caught the the whole nine of it and it was not not a pleasant time so when you see things like Dabo Sweeney as well doing a a similar poor poor taste opinion on all of this and he has a track record of doing said poor taste opinions on certain social issues you can only you can only assume that this is going to start to reflect on his character as a coach and as a person, especially when it comes to, um, you know, being a leader of young African-American men, because that's the position that he's in. You know, the best athletes in the country come to go play at Clemson, and a lot of them are black. And if you don't know how to handle something like this or really anything socially how can you see yourself as a coach or a leader of men or a teacher or anything that coach speak comes out of you know teacher or leader of men uh someone who some people see themselves as (laughs) uh lieutenants and you know war commanders and some weird stuff like that too but that doesn't work either because you d- never will know, one, how the experience of being a black person is in the world, let alone America. So I don't expect people to understand that. Because you can't, unless you are one. But 
what you can do or what you should do is understand what exactly we are trying to say and what is actually happening in the United States, in the world, on the ideas of police brutality and how there's a disproportional amount of police killing black people. And it's not some, you can't use your ideals of Christianity this time. People don't want to hear that. And it's not a, the fact that people aren't Christian or people don't have a faith that they follow. It's just that there's there's cold, hard facts. There's evidence. There's statistics. There's videos circling every other day about the police doing wrong things. And if your ideal is that Oh, it's sinful, and this is just something that comes with the package. That just sounds very, very dismissive of what's going on, and it makes you look extremely out of touch. But that is it for the GSMC College Football Podcast. I hope everyone has a better week, and we'll be keeping it locked in. So stay tuned as more news about college football as it's returning is slowly but surely happening. Uh, we'll be here with all the news. So don't forget to follow our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And please keep listening, share, like, and subscribe, and give us some five stars maybe. That would be good too. So this is Ethan for the GSMC. See you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from football to basketball, baseball to MMA and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.